Every word like linear operator, so operator means it basically operates on what's to the right of it. You could also call it a functor because it eats functions and gives you functions. So there's a lot of words you can use to describe the derivative. All right, we're going to uh, use the fact that you can take multiple derivatives. So we're going to start with f of x equals 5x minus x to the 3 halves. So I want you to find f double prime of x. So we can write that as d dx d dx f of x. And the way we're going to do it is do one derivative first. And then after we do that, we're going to take the derivative of the derivative. So right now, go ahead and take the derivative, the first derivative of this function. And I got the powers written out pretty nicely. Strongly recommend you do not write a first power. Because when you see that, you should be thinking derivative, not first power. So you should not be writing first powers pretty much anymore. And you also shouldn't write 11th power either, because that will look like prime prime. I don't think you frequently are going to write 11th power, though. So get that derivative right now. All right, questions on this derivative. Should be pretty straightforward. So now, take the derivative of this, this function right here. I don't care. Yeah, I don't care if you leave it in power notation or square root notation or negative power notation. It doesn't really matter to me. Whatever works for you. Now, yesterday, somebody asked if you keep taking derivatives, if you'll always get to the zero function. If you start with the polynomial, you'll eventually get to the zero function after whatever number of derivatives you need to go. I think one past the degree of the polynomial to get zero. But you can see right here, if I took another derivative, just looking at the uh, x of the negative half power, my new power would be negative 3 halves. And if I take another derivative, it would be negative 5 halves, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you're going to find basically anything that had a vertical asymptote, the vertical asymptote is going to stick around, no matter how many derivatives you take. Uh, Different things happen with different functions, but overall, it is not true in general that if you keep taking derivatives, you'll get zero. That's only really for polynomials. So this is 3.4 derivative as rate of change. So for example, the area of a circle area equals pi r squared. So that should be common knowledge from some geometry class at some point. 
area of a circle, A equals pi r squared. And now we want to think about how fast does the area change when the radius changes at a certain rate. when the radius is 5 meters. So the answer to most questions I'm going to ask you for the next two weeks or three weeks are going to be take the derivative. So this whole chapter is basically called derivative and applications. So when in doubt, if I ask you what to do, you can say take the derivative. And now you'll be right probably 80% of the time. So that's what we're going to do here, take the derivative. Now the question is derivative with respect to what variable? Five meters. Well, five meters is a number. Um, pi r squared. So I see a. Pi is not changing. Pi is not a variable. It's a letter, but it's not a variable. So I see A and R. Those are the two variables, or the two letters that I see here. So we can either take a D, D, A, or a D, D, R. And we're going to look at the difference between these two. So if you take D, D, A, what you're going to get is how do things change uh, in relation to when the area changes. So the DDA is change with respect to change in A. And the second one, DDR, is change with respect to change in R. And so in this case, I don't think I worded this nicely. I should have just copied right out of my notes. How fast does area change with respect to to uh, the radius. Oh, that was me. Shame. All right, so how fast does the area change with respect to the radius? Um, when the radius oh. when the radius is five meters, okay. So if I know how fast the radius is changing, I want to see how fast the area is changing. So we're going to take a d dr of this whole equation. So on the left side, there's really nothing to do. So what you should have learned algebra overall is whatever you do to one side of an equation, you have to do to the other side. You can't just do stuff to one side unless it's multiply by one or add zero. Those are about the only two things you're allowed to do and have things not change. So we have to be fair, if I'm going to take an R derivative, I have to do it to both sides of the equation at the same time. So on the left side, I'm just going to leave it as dA dr. Now on the right side, pi is a constant because our variable is R. So I'm taking an R derivative, so pi is, pi is always constant, but uh, specifically here, we're taking an R derivative. So it's going to be pi 
times ddr of r squared. What is ddr of r squared? 2r. 2r. There we go. Isn't that the circumference of a circle? Yes, it is. One thing we'll find out, derivative of area is perimeter. And derivative of volume is surface area. And derivative of other things are other interesting things too. But specifically in geometry, that works out for most, most shapes. Um, yeah, well, let me do a few more examples of that. All right. So what do we do with the DA over DR? So DA over DR is how the area changes when, uh, with respect to how the radius changes. So DA DR is change in A divided by change in R. Oh, okay. So it's how the area changes as the radius changes. Basically. basically. And so, so I said the size, of the radius was 5 meters. So I'm going to put 5 in for R right now. So we got 10 pi. So what this tells you is, uh, and you could actually solve for dA. You can treat it like a fraction. So if you knew how fast the radius was changing, the area would be changing 10 pi times faster. So if I said the uh, radius was increasing 1 meter per uh, per second is a really fast growing puddle, but uh, one meter per hour, let's say, your area will be changing 10 pi times faster. So it would be 10 pi, and you have to change your units too, 10 pi, what meter squared per hour. So if you know how fast your radius is changing, your area is changing 10 pi times faster. So like 30, 31.4 something times faster. Yep. And yeah, cylinder would actually look pretty similar. Um, and we'll be doing related rates, which we'll be looking at um, lots of cones and uh, spheres and other weird shapes filling up. And you know, you know the, maybe the rate of flow, the change in the volume, like one gallon per whatever minute or hour, and then how does the volume change? So we'll be looking at plenty of geometrical shapes and filling them up with water and figuring out uh, how change in the volume relates to change in height and different things like that. In this class or in yeah, in this class. Fine. Yeah, that's related rates, which is chapter four. All right, so that is how change in area is related to change in the radius. Now, it was important to know what R was. If your puddle is really small, maybe increasing by a meter has a very different effect on how much the area would increase. Versus if you're, you can see if the puddle is really big, if your radius is a big number, a small change in the radius creates a larger change in the area. If you just think of increasing your puddle by an inch, if your puddle is really small, the area might grow a little bit, but if your puddle is half a mile wide and you increase the radius by an inch, you get a huge amount of area that, just, that that puddle just gained. So how would that look graphically? Because it wouldn't be like a problem, that would be opposite. Exponential? You could graph, um, you could graph DA and there's really three variables in here. There's DA, DR, and then also if you didn't fill in a radius, there's also an R. So there's really three variables in, in this, in this equation right here. Uh, so you'd kind of, you'd have to fix one of them. So if I knew how fast the radius was changing, I could graph DA compared to R, or if I knew how fast the area was changing, I could graph the other two in relation. Okay. Uh, I don't want to go too much into that. Um, but, but if you know how one's changing and you know the current situation, you can find how the other one's changing, basically. Uh, just like if you're going to pour like a gallon in a minute into a container, if it's a really tiny container, it's going to fill up really, like you fill up a you know, chemistry beaker with like a jug of water, it's going to overflow really quick. But if you fill up like a huge, maybe there's the same height, but it's like a trough, you know, no problem. It's not going to increase the height very quickly, even with the same rate of flow. So, um, 
depending on the shape of your container, is going to fill at different rates. So that is some physical quantities relating. We're going to look at motion. Now, because our tools are very limited in calculus class, we're going to look at motion along a line. And the properties we're going to have are displacement, <coughs> velocity, acceleration, and jerk. All right, jerk is appropriately named. We'll talk about that. But if you experience a lot of jerk, you're probably in a car driven by a jerk. So we'll look at that. Uh, and not in a good way. All right, displacement. So we'll talk about that. We'll go in order. Displacement from T to T plus delta T. So normally you saw this as T plus H. So it'll be some time and you'll move over some small value right there. So before we were using the variable X for our inputs. Now we're going to look at uh, motion occurring over time. So we're going to use T as our independent or our X value, our X variable. So displacement. So our displacement is delta s, which is f of t plus h minus f of t. What is the s table? I'm not 100% sure. You have a calc book with you? I might say in there. Yeah. I mean, it's a distance is what it is. So it's a distance from one, uh, in this case, it's change in y value. So we don't have to worry about any h's in any denominators for that. Oh, well, we're about to. Okay. So that was the numerator of our rate of change. So what we... Speed? speed? So it's measuring a distance, so I'm not... They do use S in your book, hopefully. They do. Okay, good. Displacement. Displacement. So I don't know why the S... So you don't want to go delta D because we use D's for derivatives, so that would be a bad letter to use. I don't know why they chose S other than there's a third letter in displacement. It's probably better than delta I. Uh, so I don't think there's a good reason that they chose S. Um, and you can just spell out displacement if that works better for you. Or DISP might be better to write. All right, so average velocity is displacement over time. Or change in displacement over change in time. All right, that is average velocity. So if you have one position and another position, you can compute how far apart they are, the displacement, the difference between them. And if you knew it took you know, three seconds to go that distance, you can do the distance divided by three seconds. That'll give your uh, you know, feet per second, meter, whatever you measured in. It'll give your uh, distance measurement per second in that case. So this is just average velocity over some amount of time. And h will be that elapsed amount of time. So that's average velocity. How about instantaneous velocity? <laughs> so 
So this is uh, velocity for h seconds. How do I take this average velocity for h seconds and get instantaneous velocity? You bring the h out of the denominator. Well, I'll do that with algebra, but what do I need? Why am I doing that? To say h is closer and closer to zero. Yeah, so we want a limit here. So we're going to send h to zero. Lim h approaches zero. So if we measure with a smaller and smaller amount of time, if we take the limit and make it infinitely small, we'll get the instant instantaneous velocity right there. So that's how we get instantaneous velocity, and that uh, zero, cha uh, zero change in time. Okay. Yeah. So this is ds over dt, which you can write as s prime, uh, and we'll write v of t. So that'll be a velocity right there. So that's instantaneous velocity, or really just velocity. All right, speed. Speed is almost velocity. Except speed doesn't have a direction. So you don't say I'm going negative 10 miles an hour. Well, that's pretty fast to go backwards in a car, but negative 5 miles an hour in the parking lot. Your car will probably just say 5. It won't put negative. Or your speedometer won't go past 0. So speed is the absolute value of velocity. And it has no direction. Uh, it is a magnitude. So your velocity might be going to the right or to the left or up or down, whatever direction you're measuring in. But your speed is the measurement of the length of that vector. So it doesn't matter if it's pointing left or right, and it's just how long was that vector, and that's your speed. <laughs> Acceleration. So what is acceleration? Acceleration is how does your velocity change? So velocity is basically how your position is changing. So if we look at how your velocity is changing, we get acceleration. So I'll write that as a of t, acceleration at time t, is d dt of ds dt, or d dt of v. I think my original function, yeah, was f. So I'll just write, I should have written f prime of t up here. So our velocity was f prime of t. Acceleration is f double prime of t. So take your derivative of the derivative, and that's your acceleration. So when you're with a new driver or a bad driver, you'll experience a lot of jerk. So jerk is the change in acceleration. So you could write it as f triple prime of t, or you can write it as d dt of the acceleration function. So if you're with a race car driver, you'll probably experience extreme acceleration. But what you won't experience is extreme acceleration braking, acceleration braking, and the gas pedal going cr like crazy. All right? Even if somebody's an aggressive driver, if they're good, they'll push the pedal down quickly, but not in a jerky motion. So you experience high acceleration without it being jerky. So no matter what, unless you're a bad driver, you should not be experiencing very much jerk. So that's change in acceleration. So when you're driving and you're looking ahead, you don't need to do things too quickly because you're seeing what's coming up. So you want to minimize the jerk, especially if you are uh, driving in snow or ice. Snow or ice, you've got to be careful with acceleration too. But no matter what, you should not be experiencing very much jerk while you're driving. 
Now we're going to look at a velocity graph and then make statements about what's happening at different times here. go x values up to 8. I made that part between 5 and 6 extra bold because it's right on the x-axis. So It has a velocity there, it's just 0. And I wanted to make sure that we saw it. So now we're going to answer questions about this velocity graph. So what t values is the particle So we'll start with moving forward. So what does moving forward mean if you're thinking about velocity? Positive. So if your velocity is greater than zero, you're moving forward. Don't think about it more than that. So what does positive mean? It means not zero and not negative. So when is it positive? <clears throat> so I want a positive velocity. I could write uh, inequality vt greater than zero. So where is v of t greater than zero? There's plenty of places it's greater than zero. So how about one to three? That's the first place I see that's greater than zero. What are the x and y axes represent on this? Oh, time. So we got t axis, and then this one will be uh, velocity. Yeah, so we got zero to, let's say, eight seconds, and then velocity is feet per second or meters per second, whatever units you want to measure in. All right, so when is V of t greater than zero? So the first interval I see is zero to three. Now, at zero, what is our velocity at zero? Zero. zero. So you can't say it's moving forward or backwards. It's actually not moving at the instant t equals zero. So we're going to go open 3, uh, 0, and open at 3. So I, at the ends, we're not moving. We're actually stopped at the very ends. Is this the only place we're moving forward? No. Where else are we moving forward? 6 to 8. 6 to 8. So 6 has the same issue. What about 8 on this graph? Are we moving forward at 8? No. We are. At 8, we're greater than 0. So what happens after 8? I don't know. My graph ends at after 8. So I can't say anything about what's happening after that. That's the end of the world right there. Uh, so you said that speed has no direction. Why does velocity have no direction? So velocity is, uh, so this is not speed. This is velocity. If I drew a speed graph, I would be drawing an absolute value. So it would look like that. And I get rid of that stuff. Speed is, speed is always positive. But if I had a speed graph, we couldn't talk about moving backwards. Yeah. We could only talk about moving or not moving. But we're still, are you talking about moving backwards as far as We're about to, yes. So this is just moving forward. Okay. All right, so I was moving forward. That's the only places that were positive. Now we go, of course, moving backwards, which of course is negative velocity. 
All right, I think there's only one interval that's negative, and it should be obvious, three to five. So it'll be open interval three to five. So it's forward, backwards. So any questions on that, that should be pretty straightforward. If you got the forwards, that's pretty much. It doesn't matter that it has a positive slope in the Oh, that's a good question. So we're about to look at that next. Okay. So that affects, that doesn't affect the fact that we're moving backwards. Okay. But it certainly we're not moving backwards at the same speed or the same um, rate. rate, yeah. So question for you. Yeah. And, and actually everything between five and six also. Oh, yeah. okay. So there'll be, yeah, we'll have constant as one. Um, and we'll do that right now, constant. Uh, well, we'll worry about constant in a minute. Well, we'll do stationary. Stationary is V of T equals zero, also known as X intercepts, or I guess in this case T intercepts. So we got a few values, 0, 3, and then everything from 5 to 6, including the endpoints. So we're going to write 0, comma, 3. And if you want to, you can wrap these in curly brackets. That's how you signify individual values instead of the interval. Uh, union, five, 5 to 6. I just think of the curly brackets as like a bag. It's like a bag just holding some values inside of it. That's all. A little paper bag, you're just throwing some numbers in there. Not at all an interval. Uh, it comes from the set builder notation, basically, where you're just explicitly writing down every, well, in this case, both values that are inside that set. All right, velocity increasing. So we have a velocity graph, and I want to know when is the velocity increasing. So I'm asking question here about the slope. So I want to know when is the slope positive. I'm not asking, I don't care about the y value. I'm asking about the slope. So this y value might be positive, might be negative. That's not relevant. Look at the graph. I want to know when is the slope positive. So what is the first, the smallest interval that you see where it's positive? So we got 0 to 1. And I can't use that. That's actually a corner point the way I drew it. It makes a sharp, cur sharp corner. So I'm going to go open interval 0 to 1. All right, next interval. Where's the next increasing interval? Four to five. So we're going four to five. Yes, we're going backwards, but we're going backwards in this case more slowly. Why are they open brackets on the first interval? Um, uh, technically, we'd be right, or we'd be, I'd have a right derivative at that point. So you, you probably could put zero in there if you wanted to. Well, it would never equal zero, right? Like the zero were not moving. So because the time was started when you start moving, right? So, so I'd have a one sided I have a one sided slope or a one sided limit right there, but not a necessarily two sided. Um, I I'm not too worried about that right there. I was there. just trying to figure out when to do open. You could you could go close right there on in this particular case. Uh, I'm going to leave it open though because there's not a double sided there's not an actual slope right there. It's only a one sided slope. 
All right, so it's slope positive. All right, we said four to five, we're going uphill also. Now I definitely want to leave four open. What is the slope at four? We got a flat slope. So I can't say that the slope is positive right there. Um, and then at five, uh, at five right here, it's a little hard to see, but slope will also be flat right there. Um, it's either flat or there's a sharp curve, like there's a, sh a corner. So either way, the slope is not positive. It's either undefined at that point or it's zero, depending on if it's a sharp curve or not. So that's four to five. Last, what's the last? So we got six to eight. And I'm just going to be careful and just go open at eight because I really only have a one-sided um, slope at eight. So we'll go open six to eight. All right, so of course, velocity decreasing next. So same thing, except when is the slope negative? So is it safe to assume that it would always be open brackets on velocity? Yeah. Um, question for you, would you say two through four, or would you say two through three and then three through uh, my graph's a little ambiguous. It doesn't look like my graph actually has a zero slope right there at three. So let's go all the way from two to four. Just the way I drew it, it doesn't look like it has a flat slope right there. So we'll go two to four. And is there another interval? I think that might be it. Yep, the rest is all uphill or flat. All right, and constant speed. Or velocity, however you want to think of it. All right, so when is our speed not changing or velocity not changing? So you got one to two and five to six. And we're going to go, you can't really say the derivative at, well, if I made a sharp corner at one, which it sort of looks like, and a sharp corner at two, I'm not going to include one and two right there. So one to two, and then five to six. So let's say there's a sharp corner there, and then this is smooth right there. Would four also be included? That's a good question. We'll get to that in a minute. So we'll go five to six. All right, so constant speed, that means slope is zero. So I think at five, we actually have a slope of zero. If we look closely, at five, we have a slope of zero. And then at four, we also have a zero slope as well. And we'll put four in its own set like that. So when does a particle experience maximum speed? And I put the word speed there on purpose. It's sort of a trick question. Maximum speed. There's actually one answer. Why is four the right answer? Yep. So we're looking at absolute value of the velocity. So this particle goes fastest, actually going backwards at 
you could say negative two whatever units meters per second in velocity, but it would be counted as two meters per second, regular two in speed. So at four, where our speed is two. Let's do an example with uh, actual equations and uh, algebra and calculus instead of just looking at graphs now. So we have a free fall equation. Before we go on, minimum speed. Oh, there's plenty of times where it's the minimum. What's the minimum speed? Oh, we can go way slower than one. Zero. So I think that will be answered in the uh, stationary part right there. So. Number three would also be minimum speed. It's certainly possible if our graph never had any x-intercepts, we may not have a minimum speed or it may not be zero. But this graph has a, a zero speed quite a few times. All right, free fall equation. And I could have asked other properties. I could have asked uh, things like when is the speed increasing the fastest or things like that. But this is these are just some. Uh, more basic questions about that graph. So our free fall equation is S of T. Does somebody who knows physics, I th this is in something per second, is this feet or meters per second? Meters per second? Okay. Oh, this is in meters. at time t. When we take a derivative, that'll be velocity, which is in meters per second units. All right, so we've got our free fall equation. And we're going to answer a couple questions here. How many meters does a rock fall in the first two seconds? Uh, it depends on what units you're in. You can look all that up on the different units. Um, most of them are listed as acceleration of gravity in meters per second squared. Uh, and we'll, we'll go through a few times where we take derivatives in when we do and get into integrals too, antiderivatives. All right, fall in. Do we need to have all those memorized then? Or? No, okay. not, not for this class, no. All right, so I want to know first two seconds is zero to two. And then I want to know about the second two seconds, so after, between two and four. So it's been falling quite a while. In two seconds, how long does it fall, or how far does it fall between two and four seconds? <coughs> Let's answer those two questions right now. So all we need to do for these is, this is delta S, is going to be S of 2 minus S of 0. And the other delta S is S of 4 minus S of 2. So I don't, I'm not asking about average velocity. I want to know just distance traveled. So this is not per unit time. This is just distance, end distance minus start distance right there.
What's 4.9 times 12? So the first two seconds we fall 19 meters, 19.6 meters, and the second two seconds, same amount of time, we're falling way more. So you can see already the average velocity, we haven't computed it yet, but the average velocity is going to increase quite a bit from first two to the second two. Because you're going down. You, you, I could have uh, started with a positive and just said down instead. So it's a, it just depends on how you want to uh, measure. So in this case, if we graphed it, uh, we would be looking at something like that right there. So it would be a sad parabola with a um, vertical stretch, a uh, vertical reflection and stretch of negative, almost negative five. So it would look something like that. Now there would, the full graph goes on both sides, but this equation only models after we drop it. So that part's not relevant in this equation. This also ignores air resistance, friction, all that good stuff too.